I can tell you I've done some deep uh, exploration into myself over the last couple of years and I did a coaching course and I'm certified coach. And now I realize that where my innovation came from, uh, working on the development of nerve transfer and improved modern nerve surgery, it came from an attitude of positivity, happiness, joy, and connection. Not from the hierarchy that is academic surgery, which is a, a bit of a win-lose type of situation, um, very attached to outcome, kind of judgy and pretty stressful. When you think about even at our ripe old, my ripe old age, that we have join us and then you are pre-med. And then you are first year, second year, everything has got an adjective in front of it. And when you put an adjective in front of something, it means you're somewhat different. And the more adjectives you have in front of you, that means the more different you are. So name a, a, a non-majority religion, gender preference, gender period, uh, color difference and then put that before surgeon and that just tells you how different you are and then on top of that we layer in this instructor assistant associate whatever so when you have that type of separation you don't have connection and when you feel connected to people especially people that have a, a common purpose and a mission for me it was oh be interested in making nerve injuries have better outcomes then you start to find happiness and joy. You're not stressed at all. In fact, you're pretty darn excited about it. You don't know where all the ideas are coming from because they're not just your ideas. They're the blend. Even if you present an idea, it becomes blended with other, with other people's uh, input. And um, attached to your highest purpose, then you really start innovating and creating. So my advice is for medic starting as soon as you enter this wonderful profession just be aware that when you start to feel even in your chest just not good that that's a bit of that sympathetic nervous system coming on that fight or flight i don't like this there's something wrong with me they just told me that i didn't do well on that i'm not good enough uh and about that gender question you asked that's interesting because i think all of us that are in this specialty have had to work really hard to get here. The odds are against us for sure. And um, so we've been given this loving message by the people that love us. We really want you to be successful and reach your highest potential and you're gonna have to work really hard. And we interpret that as, are we? am I working hard enough? I remember uh, bringing home a, a test when I was in mid school, 95%. I was standing at the top of my class and my father said where's the other five percent and I remember laughing because that was ridiculous and he laughed but then I thought I still remember that and there's a little grain of truth in that so we're all taught that we're not good enough and that serves us to get here but it doesn't serve you if you want to do something really purposeful with your life and all of us went into this taking an oath to serve other people and what's a better purpose than that but then gender wise or minority wise you also get the message of be afraid. And that's appropriate, isn't it? I have um, two biracial grandsons and pretty soon they're gonna be getting the message of what do you do when you drive the car in America? Gives me a bad feeling right there. I recognize that not to be a good feeling. That is, I lose. Um, and women get that for sure. I can remember my, my father interrogating any date and, and rightly so. So um, the message then is that when you start to feel that sympathetic nervous system, you're in a bad spot. And as soon as you recognize that, you start to climb up that ladder towards positive energy. And you swiftly, as fast as you can, as soon as you recognize that, take a look at it from an area of, okay, I, I understand this is going on, I accept this, and I'm getting out of it. 
and you get up to that area where we're so good at, that is like compassion for patients. We, we know what that's like. We could maybe even direct a little compassion for ourselves, which is also a practice in itself. Today is World Self-Compassion Loving Kindness Day. What a great day to recognize that we're really good at compassion for other people and we are not good at compassion for ourselves. And there's a, you know, a simple four part mantra poem to practice, which I practice frequently every night. If I wake up in the middle of the night, I practice it again. And it's just loving kindness practice for myself. Um, and then we go to even a higher level to say win-win. Um, it's not just win for patients, but me too, win-win. And when it's win-win, you're not attached to any outcome. You're just, uh, actually, it's, you feel happy, peace and calm. And, and um, um, if there's, there's no failure because you're just learning, oh my gosh, I have a TED Talk on failure from a long time ago. And, and it's funny that now I really know this is really important. There is no failure. It's just something to learn from. My teaching style is this win-win. I'm going to ask you questions not to pimp you and make you feel bad, but find out is there anything at all I can give to you in the moments I have with you today to teach you something that I know that maybe you don't know that you might want to know. And then looking actually for those little cracks where I could actually add something. Um, so win-win. And then when you don't even care about winning, you just are being, you know, we talk about well-being. Well, let's be then, let's be joyful, let's be happy. And when you're doing that, now you're communicating and connecting with other people, like-minded, interested in maybe the same thing. And then ideas just come from everywhere and then you're innovating. And certainly in specialties, um, like reconstructive specialties, we're constantly trying to come up with better reconstructions, better outcomes, you know, amputation. Okay, well, how about replantation instead of amputation? And um, and then, and then of course, we're so lucky because we took that oath, which reminds us constantly of what our purpose on our path is. And that is a very high purpose to serve others. So what a, you know, what a better passion, purpose, mission, meaning in life. We have it. We took an oath to do that. And we just have to find that. That's a lot of advice, isn't it? Um, you know, when we were talking before about, oh, advice, I said, oh, just trust. Yeah, trust in all of that. Trust in yourself. Trust in um, the, the fact that you're here. A good word is trust. I have a mantra, and you said this was visualization. I made this for myself when I was suffering in 2018. So, I, and I tried to think of what I need, what message did I need to give to myself in 2018? Yeah, made mantra 2018. And this was um, drawn out for me by Greg uh, uh, Antrim Kelly, who's a good friend of mine and, and, a, and a, a lovely starving art artist in Virginia, if you would like his uh, website. So forward, fearlessly, courage, curiosity. And then I put here white and trust. Trust, trust the process and trust that we are fearless and we are confident and, and authentic. And uh, so that's my, that's answer number one. If you want to, st uh, we need this little hierarchy when a patient's in the emergency room or someone's in trouble, we need to know who to call, who, who most immediately, who's the person to call. Now, my husband is a thoracic surgeon, Alec Patterson, and it was very late, very late on Friday night. And uh, there was someone who had a perforation in the back of their trachea, amongst other miserable things, and they couldn't get an airway and everybody was losing their mind. And, and he went to the ICU on the whiteboard in the ICU and he put his cell phone number down. And they, I think that he said, I think it made them even more nervous because here he was giving his cell phone number if they you know, if they needed to, um, if they needed to call someone. But in those situations, we need that hierarchy. Even the anesthesiologist didn't like the idea there was no airway for a while, but he was quite calm about it because he could see the, apparently, this way to that way and knew how to deal with that. So we do need that hierarchy. But we're sacrificing that by putting um, the people in our business, the healthcare professionals, at that, living in that level of, I'm better than you, I win, you lose kind of thing. That does not, that stifles creativity. That stifles innovation. And if we want, that's the problem with, with surgery. It doesn't 
know this little secret by the question, that first question you asked, how come the, how did you ever come up with this idea of nerve transfers and modernizing nerve surgery? And it wasn't, it was, yes, it was all that hard work that I talked about in that TED talk, working in the lab, great people, all that kind of stuff, but it was living without knowing it in this very high positive energy environment where there is no, I had to say to myself fearlessly because I was feeling fearful in 2018. And, and I, and I needed to remember this, um, that, that word. So what we, what we need to do in our, in surgery is change the culture, shine a spotlight on this hierarchy for the good and the bad. And when, you know, stuff happens, you need to know, that's why we have residents, Susan, you know, because higher and lower, whatever, I get that part. I get that part. When you're at war, you need that. You need that military style hierarchy. But if you want to push the envelope and create and innovate, people have to be at that higher level of happiness and joy, connecting with other people, seeing each other as their authentic self, not wondering for me, what do men, how do men want me to dress, to sit? I can't, I can't sit the way they sit in the meeting, all covering out like this, you know, and I can't wear things that I would normally wear. No jewelry, hair back, everything tight. Like, it's just like, I'm acting the whole time. I'm not my authentic self. And if you're going to create, you have to let people be themselves, be authentic and bring their best self to the table. So the culture has to change, we have to, but I think it's just make people that are in charge aware of this and not just talk the talk of well-being or innovation or we are attached to mission. Um, it's really letting them know it's, it's costing them so much more to stifle the happiness and joy of the, of the surgeons and the nurses and the, everybody in this big system that we work in. That has to change or you're going to not be. I think we're getting the message though, 60% of physicians in the United States are burning out and that's costing money. It costs $4.6 billion a year with respect to losing losing uh, uh, physicians. And that's the data from Colin West who runs the well-being and health and mindfulness issue at the Mayo Clinic. You know, they have the Mayo Clinic burnout scale. So um, Dr. Shanafield and, and Colin West are heavily involved in that. So that data came from him. That's a lot of money that could be um, put somewhere else. You know, uh, you, you, I, I hope the audience knows that I got these five questions yesterday. Um, and I was actually offered a week to think about them. But I, I also think that um, your best ideas really come, the next step forward really comes to you much quicker than a week. In fact, in the moment. And the, and the best feeling, if you're stuck between thinking and your gut intuition, always go with your intuition. That makes a really good, good clinician as well. So of course, oh my gosh, I have a thousand operations or that, that have... Every every opera, every new transfer I have invented is because of a particular patient with a particular problem that could not be solved with inside the box of the paradigms of nerve decompression, nerve repair, and nerve grafting, every single one. But it didn't take me long, like a split second to say, this is the one I choose to answer you. Um, and that was a case um, that I did with Marco Godina. Do you know that name? He started... Um, he's a plastic surgeon. I know your orthopedics, but he um, was from um, Yugoslavia when it was Yugoslavia. And uh, in his early 30s, may, or maybe he was older than that, but early, young. And I was in Baltimore. I was doing my hand fellowship and Andy Weiland, um, past president of the American Society of Surgery of the Hand, a good friend of Mark Godina. I think they'd done hand fellowships uh, together at Kleinert in the heyday of, of Kleinert uh, um, and, and Coots. And he was visiting and I wasn't on call. There, there, with a hand fellowship at, um, at Curtis where Curtis started the hand fellowship, he trained um, under Banal who started hand surgery. So I was Curtis's last hand fellow, uh, but we're doing this case together and I'm not on call and 
um, I was, I think I was pregnant with my last child and the three others uh, and my husband were going to go, we were going to go to the circus, the circus. Oh my gosh. That's when they had the circus. And I mean, circus, like the big top circus. So we had tickets to take the kids and I wasn't on call and um, come to the short of it. I did this case instead of going to the circus. Um, so there was a lot to learn from that. Um, and my husband kept calling me and saying, what time? And I said, da, 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 move forward. And then at, at one point I said, okay, well, by such a time, and maybe it was like 730 because it would start at eight and or whatever it was, he, he drove up to the circle in front of the hospital and I came out with my scrubs on and he took one look at me and I thought, mm, that's the end of that beginning of the circus and the end of that relationship. Such disappointment. Uh, but can you imagine like prior the priorities I have written an article on advice for women academic surgeons and it's very much priority. And in this situation, I chose to do this case with Marco Godina, whose um, contribution, he died in a car crash uh, um, really young with his wife. And um, he did acute reconstruction. So massive extremity injuries and you don't delay it. So it gets all contaminated and soupy gooey. You go in and you cut out dead and you reconstruct bang right there. So it was a, a self-inflicted gunshot wound. I actually wrote this up as a case report in the, in the forearm and blew out everything. And we, uh, no wonder I didn't know when this would end because I'd never done it before, but we end up taking up latissimus muscle innervated and using it for coverage and reconstruction of the tendons and um, uh, because it was innervated for immediate uh, coverage and function of a totally blown out uh, forearm. And I remember taking a break. That went on for hours, that case. And it certainly didn't even end that day. But um, I remember splitting a sandwich. There was one sandwich, or there were two sandwiches. That's right. One for Marco Godina and one for Andy Weiland and none for Susan McKinnon, the fellow. And I remember Marco Godina splitting his sandwich and giving me half a sandwich. So there was a lot in there, but what, what it was, that whole thing was this um, level of high energy, positive energy, no, no attachment of outcome, um, no stress, just being together and seeing um, these uh, uh, two giants in their field, connecting, coming up with ideas, checking this, doing that, doing something no one doing something it was, a, it was a, a publishable case report because it was a new on many many levels and i that when you asked me that question that came to my mind because it really was that level of happiness and joy in the innovating on the spot creating together sharing um and then a little bit of throwing a little bit of guilt on my part with um, missing the circus, recognizing that as the background blend with, you know, like you see these master paintings and they're all nice, but then there's something over here that just uh, has the humanity um, uh, component to it. So that's the one I chose. Today, or uh, this season now is the season of matching of medical students into plastic surgery residency program. And um, I uh, mentor and coach a number of, of students from all over the place for some uh, unknown reason, um, at least to my husband. So I'm busy uh, tuning them up, getting them into that attitude, not that low negative, I'm not good enough, I'm afraid. You do not interview well in a, in a fight or flight, especially flight uh, anxiety. So uh, getting them to understand that it's their choice, how they want to present at the interviews, uh, even even teaching them just a quick meditation so they can center themselves out of the rumination about the misery from the past or the fear of the future. So I was busy doing that and I had behind on four. Um, so this is what I did was doing yesterday. So this is what a joyful weekend is for me. Um, mentoring sponsoring or mentoring um, and uh, coaching some of these students and I did uh, several and then um, and that takes at least half hour each. And then I'm behind on reviewing for journals. And I did four of those. Very cool. A couple actually were reviewing 
my operations that I've invented. So I at least got to stand back from that as a, a completely biased person. Um, and then I did a yoga class that was wonderful. And then you sent me that. And as soon as you sent me that, I pushed away from all of this stuff and went out for uh, a nice walk with my husband. Um, but it's amazing to me, the weekends, I love the weekends, but literally they are jammed with, um, things to do. And, and as soon I have my, uh, um, below my nice shirt, I have my, uh, running shoes on here to go out for another walk with my husband today. It's cold, but beautiful and sunny here. We have four kids, 11 grandchildren, four wonderful, uh, children-in-law and each other. And we've been married for 50 years this year. And we've just come through this pandemic together. And, um, you know, they say that if it doesn't, you know, um, kill you, it makes you stronger or something like that. But um, I really enjoy the company of Alec. And that's what we're going to do uh, for the rest of the Sunday afternoon. Um, I've got stacks and stacks and stacks of books. I love reading and I love books. Um, I was born in Canada and I love the Canadian authors. And I imagine that's maybe just because I was born in Canada. My dad was a civil engineer. We, we moved across the country. So reading a lot of, a lot of uh, writing is what you know. And so I know these parts and I, I feel very grounded with that. But um, so the, the uh, book that I gave you that came again, first to the top of my head for some very strange reason, um, was uh, A Prayer for Owen, Owen Meany by John Irving. He wrote um, something according to Gump and a, a bunch of other books, but The Prayer for Owen Meany. Um, and I read it decades ago, like in the 80s, came out decades ago, but it came right into my head and I haven't read it, you know, in decades. But I think now what I liked about it was, it was, oh, this is so good. This is great. So as I'm talking to these medical students, speaking of connection, here they are, they're all, if they're talking to me, it's because they're panicked. They're, they think they're not gonna, they all think they're not gonna match into a program. And then when they get an invitation to interview for the programs, they're, they don't know if they've got enough because the numbers are stacked against them. Then they don't know if they're good enough places. And then they have no idea how they're going to, on a Zoom, connect with the people that are gonna determine their life. And so this prayer for own meaning, maybe that came into my mind because of that, because it is one of these circular stories where you, it all comes together at the end in a, in a beautiful package, but you have no idea as you're reading through the book. So the, the story in this is you trust the universe and for my medical students too, and for all of us, it's got you this far. Why would it dump you now? You know, in, in the United States, 20% of young kids want to be physicians or doctors, but 3.3% are. And then if you think of then getting into plastic and reconstructive surgery, which I'm in, and then if I'm talking to minority candidates, applicants, and I'm saying other than the majority, and I'll tell you what, everybody in the United States, whether they know it or not now, is in a minority. And um, so basically everybody um, is worried. and. It doesn't even make sense, does it? Like the universe is taking you here. You're getting closer to closer to your purpose. And remind me what your purpose was. You took an oath to help other people. Like that's a pretty darn good purpose. So why do you think now you're going to be kicked to the side? And um, so trust is what's in this book. And um, not to give the plot line away, but it's two young boys and they're practicing all, all through this. All weird things happen and, and they're practicing this layup for some basketball dunk thing and the one of the boys is you know sort of normal side and the other but the other one's a little tiny and and so they do this like dunk thing where the boy picks the, sh the shorter guy up and they he does a dunk and and at the end of the story um which is goes over years this sh the now the shorter gentleman uses that dunk thing to move some grenade so people aren't killed or something like that but it's it's trust, it's about trust, and it's about not knowing, but trusting. And not knowing, yet knowing. You don't know what's gonna happen, but you know and trust it's just gonna be fine. 
and everything is for a reason and there is no failure. If there is failure, it's to learn something from it. So that's, I think, why I picked that book. And I might not have picked that book at a different time, but I've been so connecting with um, these students that are, as you know, as they're going into the match system, um, it, it's a pretty uh, pause, abrupt, ready, set, perform. I also mentioned Robertson Davies, who's also a Canadian author, and any of his books are terrific. He has trilogies and um, just a really terrific writer.